Welcome to MLAI 1231, a glimpse into CBS Interactive's AI ML group. Uh, my name is Andrew Schwartz, and I'm a product manager for video AI at Google Cloud. And today, it's my pleasure to introduce Adam Leary and Rob Harrigan from CBS Eyes uh, Applied Machine Learning Group. And, as the, and we're excited to have them walk you through their GCP journey. As a brief introduction, at Cloud AI, our mission is to help enterprises transform their business with the power of AI. We do this by offering a set of AI building blocks, such as our pre-trained models, as well as AutoML products, so that you can add human-like capabilities like sight, language, and conversation to your applications. Over the class course of the last year or so, it's been a pleasure and it's been an amazing experience working with CBSI as they've started to use some of these applications and apply them to two of the most common media entertainment uh, challenges. This, starting last year, they had zero services built on GCP. Yet with a really small team of just uh, seven and a half people, they've been able to build two great AI services that they can then use to power and help transform each of CBSI's 38 different content brands. Um, and with that, I'd like to pass it over to Adam Leary to continue the story. Thanks, Andrew. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, what I'd like to cover today, I'm going to try to pack a lot in. A um, little bit of background. So I think it's really important to understand the context um, from which the team emerged to understand our path to product development. So a little bit in the background and the motivation, I'll give you a little bit better understanding of where we sit as a group within CBS Interactive and um, what we have to work with in terms of data. And the motivation center on why we use the uh, Google Cloud AI building blocks. And we'll move on to <clears throat> building products on Google Cloud and review our main product components and dive into a few of them. And then we'll go into a little bit of a functional overview of the architecture of our components, as well as a brief look at the content processing system that integrates with the Cloud AI products. And then Rob will go over our hybrid recommender system in more detail. And then we'll wrap up with the uh, business impact of these product components and a brief look at what we're doing next. So as I mentioned, and as Andrew mentioned, we're a small team that is part of a larger central engineering group within CBS Interactive. So that means we work across all of our digital brands. Uh, we started from scratch on Google Cloud January uh, 2018 with no systems to migrate, so it's sort of a, a wonderful feeling in some ways. The expectation is that we demonstrate our value to the brands. Um, we meet their product KPIs, for example, and compete with other vendors, so outside competitors that come into our brands and say, hey, we offer this, brand, this service. Um, so we were able to integrate with services like uh, services for brands like CNET and CBS All Access. So inspired by the nautical theme of Kubernetes, we embarked on our own voyage. So this, this theme of Kubernetes also inspired our own product names. So you'll sort of see those show up as well. So the first question was really where to start. It's a classic question, of course. And you can do so many things in this space, you really can sort of overwhelm yourself. So to go from zero to production, we had to consider our AI business model, essentially, which is the following thing. So opportunity. So what's the opportunity? So consumer expectations are very high in terms of how they interact with video. And so the business benefit of building recommendations is also very high. So we also saw a lot of growth potential in deepening our own understanding of our own content across our brands for the entire organization and for marketing teams, product teams, sales, search, ads, you name it. So we call this approach content awareness. And our own competitive advantage is the data, the content, and our own <clears throat> ability to get to it. Um, and also, with enriching content understanding and recommendations, we took that as our starting point. And as I mentioned, the barrier for data and content was much lower for us, so we took advantage of that. 
So who are the consumers? So who needs this? Who needs these things that we're trying to build out? So one was internal teams, first of all, starting with ourselves. So sort of like a good chef, you know, you keep tasting your food as you make it. So you'll see a little bit of this later. Our consumer facing uh, customers were our brands essentially, also integrated marketing teams <clears throat> and our ad teams as well. So for example, our marketing teams want to send you know, relevant materials to the right users to let them know about the latest show on All Access. So we can help them make that happen. In terms of policy and process for our business model, if you will, we as a team really needed to orient ourselves to Google Cloud. So a lot of us you know, had not worked on Google Cloud at that time, so we were learning new technology as we went. Um, we also, some of us were learning principles of distributed computing, even basic DevOps. We're still amateurs at DevOps, but we have to do it. And um, uh, getting our own CI CD service out. So we also needed to sort of reorient our partners, the people we work with internally, to deploying living features, as I call them, that require a level of experimentation to be successful. So then how we build it. So applied's in our name. So we essentially start with cloud AI building blocks and do transfer learning. And our own success criteria were twofold. One were our own product KPIs. So when we deliver a service to a brand, what are their KPIs? We try to match those. And then our own model benchmarks for our own services internally. So as I mentioned, what's the motivation? Well, we have a lot of wonderful content to work with. So videos, articles, um, images, uh, like in image galleries, podcasts, and we have access to them from our brands. So in order to build a really good recommendation service, we needed to enrich what we know about our own content. There's a little nod to our new show, The Twilight Zone. So we have a little sample of content here you know, to give you a flavor of what we have, gaming, tech news, news, entertainment. A lot of events get covered as well, live events. So back to the how we build it. So with the cloud AI building blocks, we essentially said, what we're gonna do is we're going to use their services to get us going. And then once we get going, we'll start to build our own in-house solutions on top of it. So this essentially comes down back to, you know, sort of a classical approach to transfer learning. So we viewed using Google Cloud AI, like video intelligence, vision, natural language, as a type of transfer learning where we're trying to get achievable representations in the model sense. Time to learn is reduced for us with a very small team. And then it's going to increase performance for all of our downstream services because we don't have to think on that piece. Because it really didn't make any sense for us to start from scratch with some of those models that Google Cloud AI handles. <clears throat> so we took it from there. So speaking of time, the proof was in the production for us. So this is just a sample of some of the things that we delivered on those timelines. So also to give you a sense of where we are right now. So here's a glance at what the world looks like. So the values aren't really as important for me, but it's really seeing what we're combining across CBS Interactive. And it's really the fact that we have a living system now in production and we're able to code, deploy, manage, and deliver with a group of seven and a half people. So let me dive in a little bit to our product components. So as I said, we started with this initial idea of content awareness. So roughly speaking, we divide our world into three product classes or components. So first is content awareness. So this is our service that interacts with the cloud AI uh, APIs, vi video intelligence, vision, et cetera, as well as data from our own content management systems and other important data APIs. The second area of product is what we call video services. So these are built on top of the first service, content awareness. So for an example, automated captioning for our video on demand, 
um, processing live streaming as well, doing object detection on live streams, bounding box as, and entities as well. Um, automated clips, thumbnails, and story gisting. And we'll talk a little bit, and I'll show you a few little examples if all goes well in the video <laughs> piece. And then the third class, of course, is recommendations and search, which Rob will talk more about. So how do, we, how do we architect for all these product solutions, especially starting from zero and kind of going as you go, and implement all the cloud AI products? So what I have here for you is what I like to call a functional infrastructure. And I call it functional because I really mix architecture and services for the purpose of showing you how we process content. So a lot of our other components aren't represented here, but I wanted to make it easy to read. So working from the bottom up is a way to look at this setup here. So let me explain a little bit about the color schema. So the blue layer are the media icons. This obviously are the pieces of content that do not live in, within our own team system. The pink layers are on Kubernetes. The green, the, excuse me, the purple layer is our storage layer. The green layer on top are cloud endpoints, so our APIs. The gray layer is a messaging queue and monitoring. And the dotted box, of course, represents the um, AI, uh, cloud AI services that we use. And I'm also showing that we make heavy use of the service management API as well. So let me walk you through a really quick example of how this might work. So an editor might finalize a video for encoding in our content management system. So trawler here on the bottom will find that piece of content and say, hey, this is new send that off to our content workers to start the job of interacting with the cloud AI services, and then bring back the information around is it ready yet, and also starting to store off the results. We also then will use PubSub to emit messages to our other services to say, hey, this little bit of information is now ready. Go do your thing. And a little bit of an infrastructure call out for uh, Kubernetes is it really aligned with our design principles of immu um, immutability of services and a declarative configuration for our system and allows us to grow and scale quickly. So let me dive a little bit further into the content awareness architecture where we're using uh, video intelligence. So going from left to right here, what we do, obviously, is we're tapping into our various video feeds from, built by our own video tech teams. So we'll handle a couple of different formats, uh, video on demand and live stream, often in the form of HLS. And then we also will handle when our, our content management systems have updates or depublish something. So that's our data ops bit, as I call it. And then we'll track the operation via the service management API. It's very important when you have longer video content to really make heavy use of the long running operation to understand when that process is going to be complete so that systems aren't left waiting. And then what we'll do is we'll, we'll gather what has, ever been, what has been called by the service. So that might include for video intelligence getting this shot change information, segment level uh, labels, frame level information, and entities if needed, whatever is needed. So what we do, so in my uh, where to start section, I mentioned customers. So one way we address this need is to, sit, to make our work come alive is in a web app. So this is where we're eating our own dog food. So all the API, APIs we've built we put it all into our own web app. So what you're really seeing here is the output of some of the services that I just mentioned. So we have the, a, a video on the Aston Martin uh, Red Bull simulator, racing simulator. And as it steps through the shot changes that have been, have been detected, it updates the top level um, um, shot entities that we've also detected. And then the right hand side there, you see three little tiny video clips. Those are the output of one of our video services, which I'll show you a little bit more about in, in a minute. And you also see, of course, the output of the speech transcription, where we've done a lot of other extra processing to make the captions actually look and feel 
um, really nice. Thanks. So let me go on to one of the video services I mentioned. So this one we call Splice. So let's say we have a video about a Mars helicopter, um, which is pretty compelling to me. So what we do is we treat all of our videos as essentially a type of narrative discourse. So they're all some sort of story. It doesn't matter where it comes from. And then we'll break that down into its foreground information and its background information. And foreground and background has a lot to do with how a narrative it goes forward and how we understand narratives. So let's say we have this video clip here. This is what the whole thing looks like. <clears throat> And WTF, by the way, means uh, who the future. So <laughs> don't think I'm trying to fool anybody. <laughs> so you get a sense here. This is the clip. OK? So now we'll have to take a look at what Splice is looking at. So Rob, if you can play that first one. You can play the Splice. So what you have here on the right-hand side is the output of our uh, splice algorithm. It gives you the top three candidates of what we would consider to be the most engaging five-second clips from this video. So what we'll do, is, what we're charting for you in our own web application is the output, also the scoring for information gain on the foregrounding and backgrounding and other detail information from the video itself. And then this, these clips, these cue points, if you will, will get sent back into our video system to be picked up and then used by the brands. So as you can see here, there's often a lot of action that gets captured, often a lot of gist information around what the video is about. And that's the goal of an animated thumbnail, thumbnail essentially, is to capture your interest. So now I'll turn it over to Rob to go into a little more detail about our hybrid recommender system. Thanks, Adam. So I'm Rob Harrigan. I'm a senior machine learning engineer with the Applied Machine Learning Group at CBSI. And my focus is on recommendations. So I want to dig into two of our services today. And those services are GenReco, which is our generalized recommender, and Admiral. And now he's obviously the leader of the recommendations. He tells which recommendation to go where. So a little bit of motivation. The goal of this is we want uh, baseline recommendations for any brands that we're ingesting and analyzing content for. So we have this great content awareness built on these Cloud AI APIs output, out, API outputs. <clears throat> and we want to be able to generate some baseline content to content recommendations. <clears throat> and the fact that this is a content to content similar similarity recommender is a really, uh, it's a decision that we made purposefully. And that has a lot of motivation, one of which is that our brands are content generation sites. And so they're used to delivering content. And often, personalization can add its own issues with caching and delivery. And we don't want to introduce any of that problem for a baseline recommender. <clears throat> also, our recommendations should be content agnostic. We want to be able to take all the different types of content, images, image galleries, reviews, articles, all these different pieces of content and recommend them for each other. They're all about some topics. We can find which ones are similar and recommend them. And so we really had three pillars that we wanted to focus on when we build this platform. <clears throat> the first is flexibility, like the duck boat, or as Adam might say, the Schwimmwagen. <laughs> <laughs> and so like a duck boat, we need to be able to be on land and in water. We need to be able to handle lots of rapidly changing business logic with a small team. We need to be configuration driven and be able to select models quickly and accurately based on whatever the brand's needs. Second, we need to be powerful, like the Ferrari. <clears throat> New content has to be recommended quickly and slowly. We have news cycles that are very fast. Think CBS News. And we've got content that has very slow news cycles, like an iPhone review on CNET. <clears throat> So this API will also go on the front ends. And so it needs to be fast and scalable. It needs to be performant. And we need to support combinatorics. We need to be able to combine different sets of recommendations together at, dynamically at request time. Lastly, it needs to be reliable. We need to also be a 90 Civic, right? 
<laughs> since this is going on site's front ends directly, we, we can't go down. And again, we have amateur DevOps. We have a small team. We need high availability without a lot of DevOps. So we want a separation of powers between recommendation creation and serving. We want those two to be separated so that there's little overlap. So first, flexibility. By flexibility, I mean deciding which recommendations to choose or not choose based on customers' business rules and business logic. They're going to give us rules like users with five page views today shouldn't get trending, right? Or everyone who lives in Poland should get this recommendation or not this recommendation. And we fully expect these rules to be complicated and rapidly changing, and we need to support whatever the business can tell us about a user, a piece of content, any request they make to us, we need to be able to make decisions based on that. And again, as a small team, we need to be able to make these easily in a configuration-driven environment so that we can iterate rapidly and don't have any downtime. So we utilize uh, YAML language. And here's an example over here under the duck boat. Uh, so you can see we've got three recommenders. And so the first recommender would only be valid for users that the site or the brand tells us has at least three page views and is authenticated. And the second one, only valid for users with at least five page views. Notice they don't have to be authenticated. The third one is for somebody who really loves that site. <clears throat> but the point is that these variables can be anything that the brand can tell us and pass into us at request time. The second pillar is power. We need to be like the Ferrari. And this really refers to two different goals which work in harmony. The first is that we need to combine models dynamically at request time. And the second is the rapid ingestion of new content. We need speed in our time to recommendation. So besides just being able to, to select models, which is what I talked about in flexibility, we want to be able to combine and backfill models dynamically in a configuration-driven manner at request time. Support for combining recommendations really simplifies our back end because it means that we don't have to pre-compute all possible combinations. If a user is interested in articles and video on one of our brands, say CNET, we don't have to compute an article and video recommendation set. We can combine the article recommendations and video recommendations. <clears throat> and this helps with our speed of ingest because there's less things that we need to pre-compute. It also keeps our storage down. And so obviously, speed of ingest is important because time that we're generating recommendations, those pieces of content are not being recommended. If you think about the life cycle of a piece of content on one of our brands, like CBS News, it could be very short. And if we're taking hours to generate recommendations, we could completely miss the time where that piece of content was relevant. So we have support for a number of combination types. Uh, all dynamically at request time. So the first is order, so return this GenReco model, and then a fallback, some say trending or something. The second would be an interleave, so we're going to alternate recommendations, or in the case of more than two, round robin. <clears throat> the third would be score, so we have the model scores st stored in there. So if the model scores are comparable, we can combine those by the actual similarity score. And lastly is weight. So this would be, I want to take these this subset of recommendations, but maybe order them by how popular they are at the time or something, right? And so over here on the right, again, we have an example. So you can see that the class, this is a Redis recommender. And underneath in these args, we can see that we've got two data sources coming from Redis. So we've got a GenReco model, which takes input of site and content type. And we've got a fallback recommender. And you can see that one parameter sort of interleave means that we're going to return a GenReco and then a fallback, and then a GenReco, and then a fallback. But we can change that one parameter to order to return GenReco and then fallback, or score to order them by their similarity scores. The last pillar is reliability. Reliability is crucial for any production recommendation API. Our challenge is that our team has limited resources with only a few team members and no dedicated DevOps staff. And machine learning iterates fastest and works best in a, an environment where experimentation and collaboration is encouraged. That oftentimes does not coalesce well with stability. <clears throat> so our engineers and our data scientists need to feel free to experiment on back-end systems. Not, not too free, but pretty free. <laughs> <clears throat> and these recommendation models, they need to be able to create new ones without fear of breaking what's already working. right? <laughs> So this means that where we create our recommendations in the back end and where we serve them in the front end should be distinctly different systems. And you can work on one and not the other. And we can update business logic on one and not the other. 
Uh, and so this is, this is done. We should serve the best recommendations at any given time. OK, we're going to update recommendations as fast as we can. And we, we give out the best recommendations that we know of at that time. <clears throat> and Google Cloud Endpoints helps us a lot here because it handles authentication, monitoring, uh, as well as giving us a central place for API documentation, which you can see here on the right. That's uh, our portal, which is part of Google Cloud Endpoints. And it takes your open API spec, and it gives uh, some nice swagger documentation. So let's take a look at the architecture and how this enables or supports our three pillars. <clears throat> so reliability really starts with Admiral all the way on the left. You can see that the only piece of our infrastructure between our customer and Redis, which is where we store our recommendations, is Admiral. It controls what models are selected and what recommendations are returned. And it is the only choke point for reliability. Our ingest process, as Adam has already showed you a little bit, starts with Trawler all the way on the right, where we source data into the content awareness system. And then we augment it with the Cloud AI APIs and store it. <clears throat> and then GenReco is really three cron jobs. Remember, we're amateur DevOps here, and an auto-scaling worker service. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to go through these steps in a logical order. But it's important to remember that in production, these are all happening simultaneously so that we can get content in as fast as possible. <clears throat> but the first step up top there is data collector. And so data collector sources data from our content awareness system, which is augmented with the output of the Cloud AI APIs. And it stores it into GenReco and formats it in a way that we can use it. GenReco submit is what we call the next step. And so if we tried to just compare every piece of content that we get with every other piece of content, it would be an intractable problem. It would require lots of resources, and most of those comparisons would be useless. So this first step is a filter to identify, based on some uh, initial processing, we identify the content that's most likely to be recommended for any given piece of content, and then we submit those as jobs to our auto-scaling workers. Those workers then compute the actual similarity metrics based on our models, and they can scale up when content creation is high and scale down when there's no content coming in. The last step is the most important, and it's what we call GenReco. And that's where we actually create the recommendations. So we pull all the comparisons that have been computed by the workers, and we generate the best recommendations that we have at the time. And again, this is all running in parallel. At, you know, at any given time, we're just getting the best recommendations that we have at that time. So how does this meet our goals? It's flexible because Admiral can just serve JSON blobs. We can change business logic configuration easily in Admiral. It's powerful because we combine recommendations in all these different manners. We can have interleaving, score, order, weight. And all we have to do is have models in Redis, and we can combine them dynamically. We don't have to compute every possible combination that a customer might be interested in, because we have these other sets that we can use to build it. And this means that ingest happens as fast as possible. Content is constantly moving through this pipeline, and we're generating some recommendations as fast as we can. And then we're continually updating those recommendations to make sure they're the best that we know of at that time. <clears throat> Reliability. If any of these cron jobs goes down, misses a run, breaks, Nothing happens. Not exactly nothing. Something happens. But <clears throat> it's not that big of a deal. We don't, re we don't update recommendations for those five minutes. We have this buffer time as engineers to work on this back end system where it won't affect any of our customers who are being served recommendations. <clears throat> and so this low pressure environment is really great for our ML engineers to be able to iterate rapidly and create new models. Uh, so you might be wondering, boy, that's a lot of boxes. Does it actually work? I'm happy to say, yes, in multiple tests, we've shown an increase in customer engagement of 14%. So now I'm going to hand it back to Adam for the uh, conclusions and future directions. Thank you, Rob. Uh, so before I kind of go into our summary and future directions, uh, I hope that you starting to get a flavor of the types of systems on Google Cloud in general that we started to use and some of the decisions that we made along the way, which of course, you know, we're always going to improve as well. Um, but what I would like to, we, so we've sort of taken you through our own story, so to speak, 
So let's take a look a little bit at what some of the business impact we're seeing as we progress as a team. And what are some of our uh, next areas of work? So what has really emerged from our initial work is uh, a few things. So visibility uh, into our own content across brands. So what I mean by that you know, is the enrichment of the information that we get back from cloud AI services on our content. And this has also spurred some new areas for us, like we're now able to search across videos, images, all those entity objects. In turn, this, vi this visibility is beginning to address sort of a pent up demand, as I call it, from our marketing teams to be able to rely on some of these internal solutions. And also what's really important to me is that we're now a consideration for when features are being developed for our content management systems and our video tech and our video players. So our fellow teams have been very supportive in our journey and are been very strong advocates of, uh, of our progress as well. So at the onset, I mentioned we are tasked with competing head to head with a lot of outside companies that come to CBS Interactive and say, hey, let's do a POC. So we might be demoing their work with their own brands. So this is one of the motivators for us to have our own web application as well, to sort of do our own sales pitch to these brands as well, and then say, hey, we're happy to go into a test with our services and their services, and we have done that. So we're also able now to provide some strategic options for the company, and um, you know, in many cases, we can do it much cheaper. And so finally, we're here to help CBS Interactive as a whole sort of embrace the possibilities of using ML and AI, because it really is, as you know, if you work in the area, it's, it requires a bit of a mind shift. And so we also are aiming to produce some toolkits and packages that can be reused by our other data science teams and BI teams across the company um, so that they reduce their amount of initial work. So what are we gonna look at next? Where are we doing now and what are we working on? So some of the things that we're working on now and this year are following. So I mentioned earlier in the talk, video live streaming enhancements. So we are working on providing some interesting features on top of live streams, so coming soon. Second is uh, we're in the process of implementing Kubeflow for our uh, machine learning pipeline management. Um, we've really reached the maturity point where we need to sort of get ops our pipelines and allow them to be reusable by our ML engineering team and even possibly other data science teams. Another area that's really important for us is that we're exploring is uh, GANs, so uh, Generative Adversarial Networks for Recommendation Simulation. So since we're sitting as a central team among all these brands, we're often ready to go and we're waiting for the brand to do their implementation of our API. So instead of just having that be d wasted downtime, what we'll do is we'll create some GANs that simulate user behaviors have it hit our own APIs and continue to tune the models. <clears throat> uh, we're also working on stacked embeddings within the hybrid recommender that Rob went over. So one of, the, one of the great ways that it was designed is it allows us to add many different what we call flows. And so each of those flows can be a different stacked embedding. And we're starting to do our own benchmarking against um, other systems so that we can continue to monitor its uh, behavior and um, meeting our own expectations as well as the product expectations. And then the, uh, another area that we are uh, working with is using AutoML uh, video and AutoML entity extraction for harnessing some of the organizational knowledge. And let me explain what I mean by that. So for AutoML video, we'll use that for a secondary customization so as, you, <clears throat> as we get information in from the initial cloud AI, like video intelligence labels at the frame level and get the web entities, we'll often need to tune them for certain brand use cases because it's uh, a particular person or brand name might be very rare and hasn't really been seen, so it gets mislabeled. So we'll use a auto ML video to sort of do a secondary post-processing update and then we'll inject that back into our system to keep improving it. And with the uh, entity extraction, that's also gonna have a similar function within our systems. <laughs>